Um, so we're here today for our fourth Hot Talks, talk, talks in Mediation. And today, Bruce is going to be interviewing Danny Weinstein, a mediator with JAMS, one of the experts you've been learning from in the course, and arguably one of the most giving individuals around the world, not just in mediation, but in so many other ways. Um, before I turn this over, I want to explain that this project, the EMA International Mediation Training for Ukrainians, is part of the EU Project Consent. And we have three partners in this. We have from the Ukrainian Academy of Mediators, Louisa Romanadsky, and I think she's probably here. I haven't seen her yet. Svetlana Sergeva. And then from the Ukrainian Mediation Center, we have Galina Yuramenko. A number of years ago, um, Galina came to the US as part of a fellowship through the Weinstein GM's International Fellowship Program. So I've asked Galina to introduce Danny in a bit. After she gives a few remarks, Bruce is gonna open it up, he'll give a little background, and then he'll start today's interview. We'll save probably 15 to 20 minutes at the end for questions, but if any questions come up, just please drop them in the Q&A or the chat. And then with that, I'll turn it over to you, Galina. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, and one more technical issue. If everybody knows how to operate with all this translation system, interpretation, does anyone, uh, has anyone, everyone enabled the interpretation function yet? If you have any problems or technical issues, please say so in the chat and send the message in the chat. And we have Boris who will be able to help you with that. I will be switching now to Ukrainian. So now let, let me introduce a Judge Danny Weinstein. And I would also like to thank Bruce and Susan Edwards. Without this, them, this project would not be po possible. So Susan said I could uh, say a couple words of introduction. I don't know how to do this, to be honest. How can I explain or describe this person, uh, this philanthropist, this wonderful person, and the amazing success that he has uh, with his endeavors, including the training program organized by him. So I would say that today I'm mostly interested not about the number of uh, students they had or the number, the number of success stories in mediation. I could see Andrew Lee, for example, as one of uh, alumni of the program. What interests me today is leadership. I'm quite an egotistic person, and I would like to hear more about the leadership from uh, Danny. I wouldn't be trying to push the agenda of the tips and tricks of successful mediation, but you, dear participants, if you have any specific practical questions, please don't be shy and type them into the chat box. What I am mostly interested in is the decision-making process in the times of high level of pressure and trouble, how can someone find um, fellow humans and uh, collaborators to move forward at the, at the time when others fall back, uh, especially that's relevant when you have already achieved enormous success, but you still move on, you still push forward what you have to do. I'm really interested in uh, in the stories of not successes, but failures, because failures is what teaches us. So can how can we stand up again and again and over again after we fail and fail? And being able to share your failure stories is also one of the signs of leadership of a true leader for me so 
once I become a, that level of leader, I'll, I'll be able to share my stories of failure. And of course, I'm very much interested in uh, hearing more about um, Judge Danny's experiences in Bosnia, because I think, I believe that's very much relevant to what we are experiencing now in Ukraine. Uh, that was me being egotistic. So now again to you participants, if you have any other questions, please uh, type them into the chat box. So now uh, my final words would be, I'm very grateful uh, for the time and effort Judge Denny uh, invests into this uh, conversation. Uh, our world would be impossible without people like you, Denny. You are a great inspiration for me and you set a role model for me in terms of how I can keep moving and keep doing what I uh, uh, set value, uh, with what I set value. So again, Judge Danny has certain stories that turned into legends, but facts are quite valuable as well facts is something we would really like to hear more today and i hope that today's conversation would be a platform for uh, judge denny to share the facts and stories he would be willing to share so again dear participants it's a unique opportunity for all of us today uh the schedule of judge denny is so tight so we cannot imagine how lucky we are to have him today here so please don't be shy, don't hesitate, uh, ask questions. Thank you. That's it. Over to you, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Galina. What a wonderful, thoughtful, heartfelt introduction. Uh, you captured Danny perfectly. I've torn up my own introduction, and I'm just going to piggyback on the wonderful comments you've made. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our Hot Topics in Mediation series. Um, it's truly humbling to see so many of you give your uh, uh, scarce time and attention uh, to us this morning. The pleasure is truly mine and Susan and Danny's uh, as we get the opportunity to speak with you about very important issues in your lives. Um, <clears throat> although you'll hear me refer to him as Danny because he's been my friend and colleague for over 30 years, He's known as Judge Weinstein to many in the United States where he's uh, 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 an institution uh, in the world of mediation and that he has uh, more accolades than uh, time would permit us to, to share. But what's important today is gonna be the human side of, of uh, Judge Danny and the stories that we're able to elicit. And I've taken some notes from Galena and I'll make sure we circle to those topics uh, to make sure they're touched on. Uh, Danny, uh, one of my uh, initial uh, comments uh, to this group uh, several um, uh, events ago was to quote Dr. Martin Luther King and what's on his uh, memorial uh, on the National Monument here in the United States where it says, out of, out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. And the theme uh, really for our collective efforts is to help all the people who are um, here today and, and those that will join us uh, ultimately to sort of polish that stone, to be pillars of hope uh, within their families, within their communities, uh, within Ukraine, uh, not just in the days ahead, but in the months and years ahead as so, so much is gonna be required to rebuild uh, the country in a way that uh, uh, is gonna be essential. And that's really the theme as we begin today's conversation. But a little bit of background, I think, for those uh, people who have not had the, the privilege of really spending time with you, uh, Danny. Um, I, I, we could talk a, a bit about mediation and we'll get into some of that detail in a bit. Uh, but I think the place to start uh, for the benefit of this group is really a bit more of your international interest and your international focus. And back in 1999, you were uh, appointed a US special representative in Bosnia and uh, uh, tasked with uh, uh, distributing uh, funds in a post-war environment. And I, I think maybe that's a good, as good a place as any to start today's conversation. 
if you could perhaps share with us just a little bit of that experience and I'll help guide you through it in terms of some of the lessons learned, but, but why don't you set the stage for us this morning? And again, welcome. Thank you. And uh, I needn't say, I, 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 Lena said it'd take time for my busy schedule. I can't think of any place in the planet I would rather be than with this group. Um, early morning, I feel like I'm with friends, with comrades, with people that I um, share a common vision with. So this is kind of family in a way. And, and I'd like to speak to you in that, in that vernacular. Um, but Bruce, uh, and, and Bruce has full license to interrupt me, cut me off, direct me and so on so that I don't wander with our precious time and I stay on the topics that you that you want to hear. So um, I, he's been given a license. It's time limited. I don't want him to carry it with him all the time, but um, but I'll, I'll give it to him today. Anyway, uh, uh, Bruce is correct. My my international experience really did start. I was a judge, and then a, a group of us left the bench to start a mediation company, Jams. We didn't know what we were doing. Everybody thought we were crazy. No one knew what mediation was. We went out there in the world. Bruce was one of the very early people, along with some others who joined us. And then this phenomena of mediation has, with, with plenty of challenges and difficulties, has crept into most of the countries of the world now and has formed a kind of a common language for many of us uh, around the world and given us a, a tool to approach conflict, uh, problems with refugees, problems elsewhere around the world. Mine started um, when naively I, I was appointed by uh, Secretary Albright to go to Bosnia after the war there and uh, uh, to try to, along with a um, uh, uh, the former prime minister of Estonia and the minister of finance of, of Holland, uh, the three of us were charged with dividing up $14 billion uh, amongst the Serbs, the Croats and the Muslims, and to try to do that fairly um, amongst them and to what, in what was called privatization, because as you know before, it had been Yugoslavia under Tito and when it broke up, there was the money to distribute under privatization. Anyway, we were given no guidelines how to do it. We had no experience. We were a bunch of, quote, diplomats going and trying to, amongst these three ethnicities and different interests to try to fairly distribute the money. And boy, when we got there, did we learn a lesson that, you know, that I hadn't learned in the mediation room. You know, suddenly we were, we were trying to divide up the runways on the airport and the Muslims wanted their own runway and the Serbs wanted theirs and they didn't want, they wanted their own phone lines. Um, it, it was, a, let's just say it was a mess and, the, and the, there was a, a, a fighting over the few uh, valuable things like the Coca-Cola factory, the aluminum factory, all of that and people were fighting and there, were no, there was no court system it, it, to, to back it up. And so we had to do it through persuasion and reason and, and uh, the, the Europeans were there, they were all very proper and diplomatic and they worked very hard, but no one knew what the hell they were doing. And, and we were, it was kind of a, a mess. And so we would, we would try to mediate these major issues and to distribute fairly money for housing, for airports, for communications, et cetera. Um, Danny, let me ask you a question. Let yes. You a question. How did you even start to tackle that problem? Insurmountable almost from an outside perspective looking in. You had the thin veil of, of government sanction, but where did you even begin? What was your thought? Well, that, 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 there, was a, there was a structure from the Dayton Accords that gave there was an internal dedicated group of, of diplomats who sort of had gave us our directions and our orders and had organized 
some of the discussions and we had meeting rooms and things set up and we visited various plants and, and, and things, but it was pretty well disorganized. So uh, what I wanted to get to was uh, we, we struggled with it over a couple of years. I went there uh, 10 days a month for, for two years until the NATO war broke out and we had to leave because there was bombing again and so on. And then it eventually saved. But we had two years um, of, of uh, struggle in trying to make sense of this and, and to, um, um, and my preparation and training for it was only what I'd learned in mediation. I read, I read what I could about the country. I had always loved Yugoslavia when I was a student. Italy, I spent a lot of time there, so I loved the area, but I, I really didn't know very much. And a, a young messenger uh, who worked for the, uh, uh, for the diplomatic uh, office came to me one day and he pulled on my jacket and he said, Judge, uh, there's a magistrate, a Muslim magistrate who works behind the church who would like to talk to you if you would talk to him. He thinks he has some ideas for you. <coughs> and so I said, sure. And you, every, you had to do everything with security. So I had to clear it. And they, the Europeans are very formal. So you had to, you had to go down there with proper protection. Um, and and um, so I went to the church in this nice, Muslim magistrate came out. It turned out he spoke pretty good English. And he sat me down and he said, um, uh, Judge, I, I, I hope you won't find me rude, uh, so on, but I, I would like to give you uh, my ideas of what's, what's going wrong and, and how you don't understand, uh, and the rest of you there, you don't understand our people. And he said, uh, they have a mess there, right? He said, the, the Serbians are over in the corner whispering to each other, right? Yeah. He said, the Muslims there, they want the bazaar at Istanbul, right? I said, yeah. And he said, and the Croats, he said, are they bringing you maps back in the 16th century of what the Austro-Hungarians did and, and at the airport that there's a road that they, that they own because it goes back to the time of of some king in, in, in the 15th century. I said, how do you know? Have you been there? He said, no, I know, I know my people. And he said, you're never gonna get anywhere until, and you gotta understand all these people spoke the same language. They looked the same. They had the same last names, Radosevich, this and that. They were all itches. And, and, and they lived in an area the size of a small state in the United States. And yet their experience, their historical experience and their cultural experience and their experience in diplomacy and in negotiations was radically different. Now, any good diplomat would study the people and I had studied them some and, and done it, but I had sort of no real idea of how to deal with this problem and it, it stunned me. And so we, we regrouped, we tried to do, and we were actually doing better until the war broke out, the NATO, what they call the NATO war, and we had to leave, but, but, Here's what the important lesson is: out of defeat, um, uh, out of defeat comes many of the lessons that we learn. I was rather despondent when I left, and I was on the plane home, and I thought about this Muslim magistrate, and I thought, "Wow, there must be people around the world in every community who have that magic." who can reach beyond their own culture, their own experience, their own thing. One, one of our great poets, Ed uh, St. Vincent Millay, came from a little tiny town, had never been out of the 
out of her little town in the United States. And she wrote the, probably the greatest poem of American Renaissance, the greatest poem about the world. But she'd never been anywhere. She had a mind that escaped. There are people who have that magic everywhere. And I thought on the plane coming home, if we could find those people, if we could find them, empower them, have them share their wisdom with others and learn from each other, we could, this world of conflict resolution mediation could expand greatly, maybe. So I, I came back and I discussed it with the people at, at Jams, with Warren Knight, who was our owner, with Bruce, with some of the early people at, at Jams and said, got this idea, let's find those people. So we, we funded and started a program. We call it the Weinstein Jams Fellowships. And we started bringing over 10 people a year, 12, 10 or 12 people a year to the United States to train them for about six months some three months, some a year, whatever it was, and then to return them to their country, but to give them while they were there, at least our experience with mediation and conflict resolution and how this could apply internationally because it wasn't tied to a particular okay. court system or a particular group of laws. And, and Elena, of course, was one of those lucky people. We put out an application in the early days. We didn't know whether anybody would answer, but we put out an application on the internet. It was a long application. We didn't want a whole bunch of people saying, oh, I can get to the States, get a, and, and we got like three, four, 500 applications. But the, these remarkable people, it was the hardest thing in the world to, to boil it down to 20 and then pick 10 and to find the Galenas of the world. But we, 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 we started that and this is now, and then I'm gonna stop. Judge Danny, uh, this, this is, we, we do, yes, we go ahead. Judge Danny, uh, if I may, since you allowed uh, to interrupt you. Um, if we are done with the Bosnian uh, part, I would want to, uh, to um, ask something. This is very important uh, for us uh, today uh, because Ukrainian society uh, is uh, uh, very diverse uh, and uh, we face situations uh, where uh, various uh, values uh, divide people. Uh, uh, so some people uh, used to live in the occupied uh, uh, territories. Now these territories uh, uh, are liberated or are being uh, liberated. And then those uh, who dwell in the territories which were never uh, occupied start, saying, start pointing fingers and saying, oh, they were supporting the invaders. Uh, uh, they were in favor uh, of the invaders. Uh, so uh, while uh, uh, those who lived in the occupied territories uh, say uh, they knew nothing about what we had to uh, uh, go through. Uh, so uh, this is something which divides people. So uh, so uh, my question is uh, uh, how how to reconcile uh, these people? Are there any tips? Uh, are there any uh, know how? Because uh, you referred to your experience of coming to Bosnia and uh, learning from that priest that you knew nothing about people who live there. Uh, so uh, my question is what to answer uh, to those who uh, tell us, you know nothing about my experience. Uh, uh, and here the situation is slightly uh, different from yours because you were told that you knew nothing about uh, people, but you were a foreigner in that country. And we're talking here about Ukrainians saying to Ukrainians that there is no understanding. So I hope I managed to uh, express what I wanted to ask you about. Oh, I, I think I get the question. Bruce, did you want to in, 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 intervene there? Because I, I can answer it, but, but I, I can see you 
you well, no no it's Bruce, just, Bruce, I, I, Bruce has the magic of being able to crystallize uh, 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 thoughts in a way that uh, is a real gift. So you go ahead. Bruce. No no I love Galena's uh, directness and obviously we're here to try and bring value to the assembled audience and what could be more valuable to them than trying to think ahead in those days when uh, uh, refugees will be repatriated to the country and communities uh, broken apart will need to somehow come back together and all the myriad of challenges that that uh, suggests around uh, homes and businesses and like Galena said families and, and friends that are torn apart by uh, past behaviors how does one begin to try and address that uh, and reconcile those kinds of human interactions uh, based on, on those profound differences of how people responded in this uh, uh, just uh, war-torn environment? Well, well, you know, what, what's exciting is what we learned out of the failure of negotiations in some ways in, in Bosnia and others was that there were perhaps better methodologies of dealing with the huge disruption, disruptions that were, especially with refugees and with the uh, large numbers of migrants around the world, and that we had to develop a different modality, a different method of, of, of dealing with those problems if we were going to be successful, if we were gonna find peaceful ways of resolving conflict, that there had to develop a whole core of people more sensitive, more informed, more culturally aware, more uh, flexible and better listeners, better um, and, and marshal those resources to try to deal with the huge dislocation and both cultural, economic, and other differences going on in the world. And, and what's exciting to see looking forward with all of the drama in the world and so on is this core of people around the world, teachers, lawyers, judges, with some wonderful examples like in Rwanda, like in a, a lot of emerging countries where mediation Georgia, places where mediation is becoming the first step, not the last step, where people are beginning to say, hey, before we go to battle, before we litigate, before we fight, before we, let's see if there's a peaceful way of resolving it. We're not there yet, folks. I mean, we got plenty of, <laughs> and, and Galina, we got plenty of struggles left. But look how far we've come in the last, since the day that Muslim magistrate schooled me in the, in, in the little church in Sarajevo. Uh, look how far we've come and how, for instance, we, we just had at Pepperdine a conference with some of the top uh, diplomats in the world, how to break stalemate in all of their discussions. And how does mediation not replace diplomacy, but marry with it in a way that we can solve some of the problems that are irretractable? Wouldn't you love to be in China right now with Blinken and Xi and, and, and have a chance at getting behind what's on the paper and, and see what's really going on? and how much it affects all of our lives and, and to at least bring some new tools to those discussions doesn't mean we have some magic formula. It just means that in the past, diplomacy has been stuck on one dimension. And so the excitement of all of what we're involved in, and then we can talk about it in Ukraine is in, 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 in what you're dealing with is to see the modality of peaceful conflict resolution, mediation, and other aspects of it applied 
to a whole range of world problems and are finding some successes, some failures, but at least the conversation's beginning. We realize that in every country where there's dislocation, refugees in the host country are gonna have lots of problems, human nature. And unless there are people trained to help them, it's gonna turn into a disaster. And so the excitement of all of us in this movement is two things to me that are different. We have lots of comrades. We have people speaking the same language of conflict resolution around the world. It's almost like you look someone in the eye and there's a nod. Yes, I've learned how to listen. I've learned how to, I, I, I've learned how to hear both sides. I'm better at empathy now and, and, and understanding where people are coming from. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm trained for all that. And I've got people in the room who've had the same training and who are on the same page. Doesn't mean we don't still have lots of problems, but we speaking a common language around the world. And that's the excitement of our movement, folks. And we're, we're a long way from where we were 25 years or 20 years ago in Sarajevo. But I'd say we're maybe halfway there or a third way there. Soon kids in school will get this training from very early. Police officers will have it around the world. Army commanders will have it. People in, in your families, kids in, kids in school and in their gangs will have it. We'll have a different tool. It won't solve all the problems, but it'll be a hell of a lot better. That's the excitement of your experience in Ukraine, and we can talk about that more specifically. But Andy, we've come a long way. Great. Okay, I'm done. No, uh, perfect, perfect. I want to slow down just a little because there's so many important things to unpack in your comments, and I'll try and do it uh, sequentially. First of all, for the to complete your uh, sort of uh, very humble approach to discussing the Weinstein Jams uh, <clears throat> fellowship program. I think it's important for everybody to appreciate what a difference one person and one idea can make. And so uh, this sort of very humble beginning of your disappointment flying back from Bosnia, not being able to complete the mission, at least to your satisfaction in those days, and the, the thought that dawned on you about finding these unique individuals in communities around the world and trying to bring them uh, together uh, through troop training. Now uh, we are you know, over a dozen years into that program with more than 145 graduates like Galina uh, spread out over uh, 75 countries around the world. And I say that both to sort of bring appropriate uh, due to the program itself, but more importantly, just to help people appreciate what a difference one person, one idea, one sense of trajectory can bring, you know, in this uh, uh, this world. Uh, and and a related sort of thing I'd like you to to touch on, Danny, is sometimes um, it can be overwhelming the the problems that we confront. Uh, in the world of, of dispute resolution, and particularly these good people in front of us. Uh, uh, where do you start? Uh, how do you even muster the fortitude to say, I'm gonna get up today and I'm gonna identify and tackle a problem and try and make a difference in my family, in my community, because you know not everybody has the opportunity to, to sit at the highest levels and, and try and bring peace uh, you know, to world conflict. But what do you say to those folks that are wondering what difference they can make? Well, I, 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 I wish I had the formula and you have to guard against sounding uh, preachy, but, 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 uh, but one of the great things about mediation I found is that when it's, um, we often talk about it is two parts. Uh, um, one is, and in, in Rumi's our great guide about the arena where people wake up and 
they're in conflict wherever they are and they, they're battling in the arena and how good mediators guide them into the field, what Rumi called the field, the field where people listen to each other, the field where good things can possibly happen. And what mediators around the world learn to do, and they learn it different techniques using different cultures and so on, is how to guide people from the arena, which is ugly. Lots of accusations and, and hurt and, 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 and anger and everything else, and how to bring them into the field where often trust and good things can happen and grace and, and, and things happen. And that's what the masters, the, the people, mediators, whether they're school teachers, whether, they're, uh, whether they've just learned it or, or the gifted mediators, that many of whom are part of this program, they, they, they learn how to suit up, put on your armor, get into the arena, somehow um, absorb all that stress and poison and anger and disappointment and hurt of people. Take it in and feed it back with some of the poison out of it. And that's a gift. And it's a, and, and, and when, when human conflict and all that is presented without the poison thorns. And I think of, that's what I think of myself every morning going in there. I put on my armor, I go in there and, I, and I'm picking out the poison on both sides until finally, finally people are at least talking. And you, you see the air change. When, when that happens. And it's a wonderful experience and it's worldwide when, when it happens. And so what Bruce didn't say was uh, there was a second miracle that happened out of this first finding this Muslim magistrate, then all of us starting a program where we drew over a hundred uh, uh, people like Galena from around the world and train. But what we didn't know was that they would connect with each other, that they would form a kind of an international fraternity sorority and begin projects that are just really starting and the possibilities of it whether it's the Silk Road project in, in Asia, whether it's all of the things that are going on that we're experimenting with and we'll have plenty of failures. But we've just had the first project in the Middle East where all of the participants could be there. Women from Egypt showed up for, for with Ruth and others for, for uh, uh, projects in mediation. And, and came and there they are doing it. That would have not happened 10 years ago, five years ago. So it's happening. It's happening a lot with women. People are being empowered. It doesn't mean we're gonna solve all the problems, but we've got another very important tool. And I, I wanna remind you what I said before that what the prime minister of Georgia said to Bruce and me and others, maybe, maybe seven, eight years ago when we were in uh, Tbilisi at a big conference of mediation. And this Minister of Justice, I think she's very high in the administration now in the country of Georgia. She's about five feet tall. There's a very uh, 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 low voiced. She got up there and she said, hey, let me just tell you something. Alternative dispute resolution, ADR, in Georgia, litigation's the alternative. Mediation is gonna be the first stop. And I said, wow, I've thought of myself as the alternative all my career. For the first time, I'm not the alternative. We're, mediation is, yay. But, but here it took this woman from Georgia to say it 
in a way I'd never heard it. ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, the alternative should be litigation. The, the first stop should be some type of mediation. And we can adapt mediation folks to, we can adapt it to cultures, to all of the new technologies, to, to bringing in different disciplines. Bruce, for instance, brings psychology into his, into his teaching. There are all sorts of other disciplines that mediation is a big open space for us to fill, to solve problems around the world. We won't solve them all. We won't do away with war. We won't do it. And, 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 and I, but I don't think they're going to replace us with artificial intelligence, by the way. I don't think they're going to have an artificial intelligence mediator up there who's saying, no, 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 that's not true. Uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope we'll be the last ones to be replaced by AI, but, but maybe there are things we can learn um, it, 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 from it um, also. So you're in, um, and then let's, we can talk about it as it applies to you, Galena, to your area and where all of you are, but we're in a very exciting time in the, for those of us in the world of mediation, we have some failures. We have some successes around the world now. We have some things that we're just getting started with. We're, we're, we're taking this modality and learning that it can be changed, inclusive, that we have allies now. We have kids in the schoolroom who've created conflict corners and where the Eight-year-olds are mediating the fight out in the in the schoolyard. We have firemen who have their own mediation system in the firehouse. We have police officers. We have in our new class this year, we've got three or four of the participants are police officers who want to come. They say, I want to learn something besides my pistol. Danny. Let me, let, me, yeah. let me ask you a question. Again, I hesitate to interrupt as always because it's such a fountain of uh, helpful thoughts uh, and inspiration. Please do interrupt. No, you, you talked about successes. And you know, as mediators, we learn very early not to compare different people's <laughs> experiences. And one of the sort of traps for mediators that you want to avoid or judiciously as you know, suggesting that people's experiences are the same. They're not, but there are things we can learn from each other. And one of the successes I think that we've been able to develop in the last seven or eight years is uh, what's gone on in Rwanda in terms of introducing uh, mediation and to, to give people just an idea. And, and you know, we talk about uh, dark moments in human history. You know, there are a few uh, in the 20th century that rival what happened uh, um, in uh, Rwanda, over a million people uh, killed, slaughtered, butchered within a hundred days uh, based on uh, sort of colonial influences and, and uh, <laughs> tribal uh, issues that were fomented uh, by colonialism. And without going into the history of it all, we know that what came as a result was a not just a fractured society, but one that had lost all of its leadership to use Galena's word, all, all the, the principals, all of the judges, all of the folks that were capable of leading that country were murdered or, or fled. And so as they sought to rebuild, uh, Judge Danny and I uh, first came to that country about seven years ago. And I think it's important for this group just to know what's possible, Danny, what kinds of changes can be made through really the efforts of just a few as those pebbles in the pond start to reach out and influence others within the community. Because I think it gives hope and potential license to those on this call in terms of what they can do within their own communities. Talk for just a moment about what's happened in Rwanda and, and how far things have come in such a short period of time. Well, I, I think the people that can talk the best about that are you, you and Susan who returned there numbers of times, but. It certainly was a, a group effort. And of course we had the, also the help of the former um, Chief Justice uh, Sam Rogege 
of, of Rwanda, who is now a colleague of Bruce and mine um, on, our, on our continuing foundation and is now trying to bring his experiences throughout Africa. And, and I might say that Africa is as fertile soil for mediation and conflict resolution as any, any continent. For, for some reason, mediation and its modalities fits very well within many of the tribal customs um, in Africa. And we found a very welcome uh, continent for much of the teaching in countries like Zambia, Gambia, Ghana, uh, and, and others in, in, in Africa. Um, and we wanna, we wanna, we wanna, we have hopes that it even, that it even can apply in mid-Asia and, and in, uh, and in the territories where you all are. Um, but, but what happened in, in uh, Rwanda, you know, it, each country is different in, and one of the challenges of all of us working in this is to adapt system to, uh, uh, to, to the customs of the country in a way that it becomes acceptable, that it's not um, the biggest barriers you find everywhere are the people who are frightened that it's going to displace them the lawyers who sit there like this, oh, mediation is great, but not for my cases, you know, and who are worried they're going to lose their livelihood. Um, of judges who we've been doing it this way for many years, we're not going to change our ways and so on. We, 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 we face that everywhere we go. People don't welcome change generally and say, oh, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll, we'll adopt that tomorrow. Everywhere we've gone, we've had to fight a pill to make it happen. And the miracle in Rwanda was we just, we, we, we first found leadership in a number of the local judges and lawyers who believed in it and who had the right training and came back. We had a chief justice who believed in it and said, we're gonna make mediation in Rwanda. And, and we're gonna make it happen. And then we had a group of outsiders like Susan and Bruce and others who came and devoted a lot of attention to it. And it took off to where now in Rwanda, mediation is an integral part of their system. Now, can that happen in Poland? Closer to where you are, where we have a group of young of, 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 of judges um, who, are, who are forming a, a group of me mediators, uh, uh, judges who wanna incorporate mediation even in a very uh, strong system like the Polish court system and police system, but, but yet are finding slowly more receptivity, especially amongst some of the younger people, but have to proceed carefully and cautiously because there's resistance, but that's true everywhere. But, but how, do we, how do we convert some of the older systems and show them that there's a big payoff for them? How do you incorporate them instead of thinking we're aliens trying to tell them what they're doing isn't right? And, and so that's a big challenge for us around the world because institutions, people's livelihood, people's pride, people's training is one way and they don't change easily. And you're not gonna get it by preaching to them. We, we just had a seminar, let me give you one last example. We just had a big seminar at Pepperdine, help of uh, our wonderful Suk Simran, uh, who's on our, more than many of you know, who's been uh, a helpful leader in mediation around the world. But we held a, 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 a seminar called, Can Mediation Help Solve Stalemate in Diplomacy? How can mediation 
not replace diplomatic negotiations, but how about if diplomats around the world had mediation as a tool when they're sitting down and discussing their, their dilemmas and their stalemate? And, and just think about that. All the places in the world where the diplomats have been fussing for years and storming out and World War I and think about World War I and the Dukes and the Tsars all angry at each other and millions of young men and women killed on the battlefield because they couldn't get along. How, how, how much putting them in, the, in a room with Bruce uh, and, and, and Susan for a while might have made a big difference. So, you know, um, we have to f fight to make these things work. And then I think we should talk a little bit about how it applies. Much of <clears throat> our work is now <clears throat> with the refugees and with migrant populations around the world. And how can mediation and mediation modalities help with the aftermath of the problems that you're dealing with in both Ukraine, um, obviously in Poland, the, the recipient countries, but in many of the many of the areas of the world as the migrant population grows, and sadly. Uh, if the predictions about climate change are true and El Nino and all that, we're gonna have more uh, migrant populations moving into the territories that are safe or have water. And we're gonna have to figure ways of people getting along. And this is where you and all your work and our experience in Ukraine is going to be so valuable. And, and we're just learning folks, but it's a, it's a tremendous challenge. And um, your part, I, I mean, we, you, there are times, Galena, you said, how do you keep going? How do you uh, do uh, get up in the morning and know that a lot of things are gonna fail I, I quoted to you earlier that wonderful poem of Alan, Alvin Fine that, that victory, victory lies not on some high place along the way, but in looking back at defeat after defeat after defeat, that the journey, the journey was a sacred pilgrimage. That, that, that in that is our salvation, that the work we're doing is a sacred pilgrimage. And it's true in the where you are, and it's true in all of the areas that we're just beginning to explore. And if you look at this mediation tool as a gift of that can bring about enormous uh, uh, benefits to people, um, it's a very exciting time to be a part of it. It's just, it's developed just enough that you now have people who can speak the language. You can go almost anywhere in the world and find people who are, who can mediate, but it's undeveloped enough that we're just learning a lot of things that can make it better. So what a great time to be part of this movement. All right, Bruce, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna shut up and take questions. Doing great. We're going to uh, open it up for questions here momentarily, uh, but I just want to take you back to one memory, and uh, we and that's when we first went to Rwanda. And uh, while we can look back on that uh, uh, sort of uh, seed uh, planting journey and the uh, sort of uh, crops that have grown in the last six or seven years, and we can quote statistics about you know, hundreds of mediators trained and, and um, uh, the courts uh, implementing court uh, annex mediation and now bankers and other industries uh, sort of uh, grabbing on to the, the mantle of, of uh, alternative dispute resolution and all of the other sort of indicia of success. But what stands out to me is when we, you and me and Susan and Linda and others were sitting in that 
village outside of Kigali at the opening of the community mediation center, a very humble sort of uh, <clears throat> a dirt road leading us to this brand new facility. And they, they had a ceremony uh, to sort of welcome us. But, but more importantly, what they had were testimonials of the mediation process that were in place in this small village, this community center. And we heard great stories of people standing up and talking about how their marriages were saved or their disputes with their neighbors uh, were overcome. And then at the very end, a couple stood up and one was a, um, a, a tutu and um, uh, one uh, was from an alternate tribe the, and, and they stood up, the, the Hutu and the Tutsi stood together, a man and a woman, shoulder to shoulder. And they began to speak about their experience during the genocide where this man had killed this woman's family and her children and her husband. And yet somehow, despite that unspeakable horror, they had been able to come together through a mediative process and reacclimate in their community, at least so that not only could they live side by side without guilt and hate and anger, but actually could work together in building this small business together to try and overcome what had happened in their community. And the last thing I wanna do is preach to anybody because none of us, at least from our side of the globe speaking to you today have been through anything like you have been through. But it does show, at least in one small village, the promise of dispute resolution. Yes. Uh, it, it, and it's hard for people, it's hard, it was this wonderful story, and it's hard for people to grasp. Um, I remember sitting at, up in uh, Napa at our mediation center with Harrison Mutabazi, who is now on the high court of of Rwanda and with 12 other fellows, uh, mediation fellows who'd come from around the world, as he spoke, having lost members of his family in the genocide and now was on the court system and in charge of much of the reconciliation about how he was working toward a united Rwanda where people were no longer Hutus and Tutsis, but were just Rwandans. And all 12 people from other countries, Thailand, uh, Scotland, uh, all around, were all sitting there kind of shaking their heads saying, my God, if someone had murdered my family, I'd spend the rest of my life getting revenge. Are you kidding? And, and he, as he began to talk, and he spoke for two hours, it was one of the most memorable moments of my life uh, because you watched people change. And he said, you know, we had a choice in Rwanda. We could have spent the next 30 years tracking down all the people who did the damage, having trials of people who committed crimes and, and getting revenge and so on. Or we had this choice that we could adopt these tribal methods of true forgiveness and redemption. People had to be authentic, but invite people to redeem themselves and become part of a greater and better, and they've done that. And, and 11 other people around that table who couldn't believe that they could ever be that, at least opened themselves up that there was something different than just revenge as a tool for, the, uh, for, for reconciliation. And so we've learned a lot, Bruce, and. Susan and I and others, and we're learning a lot from you all in Ukraine, both of, uh, and, and, and in Poland, both in terms of your courage and your resistance to, to, to aggression, but also in your efforts to try to take the hard work of how do we relocate, 
How do we get along? How do we how do we make a, a, how do we make something a, livable out of all of this dislocation and heartbreak? And so um, that we have some examples where people have made something great. If you go to Rwanda now, it's at least a model in many ways in, in Africa of a country doing decently economically and with a united, with a united society. So we have some ex good examples around the world and we have to continue to, to try to do that. Stones of hope, stones of hope. All right, let's do this. Um, a lot more I can ask, but I think more relevant to your experience will be your questions and to take the direction from there. Galena, maybe you can start and show people that uh, questions are desired. And uh, please, why don't you begin? Я перепрошую, у мене просто дуже таке, знаєте, просто для мене це просто перше, що важливо, це indeed. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I just cannot but state that we have a very wise man uh, sitting in front of us. And uh, I uh, uh, just uh, uh, want to uh, stress on the word uh, reconciliation used by Judge Denny. It will be very important for us to be able to reconcile. Uh, Bruce, did you? I didn't understand the question. Uh -huh. oh. uh, okay. Uh, Did you want some silence? My forgiveness, oh. no, forgiveness, no. This topic will, will be very important for us. What is possible? What? Dobre, dobre. Тоді я просто повторила вже один раз. Okay, я перейду на англійський канал тоді. We do have a few questions so, so, that have so, come in. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Because uh, uh, I know that uh, for me it's very important that we have very wise people with us uh, now. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, because we have some families which split up with war, uh, we have a lot of uh, communities which are split up with war, and we need to live together. What is possible to forgive? What is not possible to forgive? And what could help us to forgive? Good question. Yes. Um, you know, that that's a very personal question um, to everybody. And it, it's interesting how different people are in their makeup culturally. Um, I, I will, will tell you um, just a, a, a current <clears throat> experience I had um, where um, uh, the, the, it, there was a very heated long-term battle between two, two family businesses and huge businesses, but they hated each other and there was all this stuff anyway. And finally, this one of the leaders of one family turned to me and he said, so judge, what would you do if you were me? And I made the mistake of saying to him, <laughs> I said, you know, this is for me, I'm Jewish and this is our high holiday season. And um, we have a tradition that every year on the high holiday, you forgive all your grievances. You, you get rid of them. The, the tailor who didn't do your pants right, the baker who gave you the bad bread, the person who cheated you in the business, you let go of that. You can start collecting new grievances the next day, but, but get rid of it. And it's like a stone out of your belly. So I suggest, we make some reparations, but let this go. It's ruining the family. And he looked at me, 
shook his head. He said, you know, you're, you're a nice man, but you're from a different planet. He said, in my family, <laughs> if you forgive in less than 40 years, you're considered soft. He said, so that's not going to work with us, you know, but it was a very interesting question that I had of how do you get the same result, but approach it differently with someone with a culture so strong of revenge and so on, and who wasn't going to adopt some uh, uh, philosophy of every year getting rid there's even a symbol you go down to the river and you throw bread into the water. You take crumbs of bread and you throw it in the water. Get rid of this. Get rid of that. Get rid of this and start fresh. Start fresh. Because they're like stones you carry around in your belly. But, but we're learning. And, and we can't expect every culture, everybody to adopt it and we have to feed it to people in a way consistent with their culture and their uh, mentality so that they can accept it. And that's the gift of a great mediator is to put things in a form, first to, <clears throat> first to hear people and understand where they're really coming from and then to give it back to them in a way that they can accept it, put it together. And that's an art form. And that's what we're all engaged in. And Galena, we, we, we're, we're hopeful that when some of the pressure's off that we can take some of that to your part of the world and learn from people like you. I, I just, I can't leave this forum without saying, that I remember at the beginning of the war and, and all of us in the, in the US so worried and so, thing, and, and hearing your voice from the subway, um, um, talking to us uh, and your strength and your determination was something I will never forget. And all of us in your family of uh, mediators and the, 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 the Weinstein Jams family, um, we, we will never forget your strength and courage in that moment. And many of the people who you were with, it was really something. So thank you for that. Let's entertain some yeah. other questions. Yes, um, Danny, there's a question that came in early on um, about your Bosnian experience, how you finally managed to do that task with resources distribution, what tools did you use there? Well, we had ultimate power. There was no court system. So really we had the three of us had the power to distribute it as we thought, thought best. So it wasn't a normal system because there was no government. There was no, and there was no court system. And, and so we just had to use the guidance from some of the local communities. We did, we did go to the church people. We went to whoever we could and we got direction and did the best. We did the best we, we could, but it was pretty primitive system and and one that um, um, uh, I wouldn't want to repeat before th th there was an effort to make it honest because the as you know the, the Europeans and the Dayton of course they're very by the book and they had lots of rules and regulations and you had to get authority for for, for everything that you did but um, I, I wouldn't use it as a model for anything we just we kind of just did the best we could in a short period with new war coming. We did get, we did get money to people for businesses and for private homes. And we did redistribute some of the factories and other places to the local populations, but, um, but it wasn't a, 
a model of successful mediation and negotiation, no. So a follow-up to that, I think this came from someone else, but it's a nice follow-up. If you could do it over again, um, what lessons could you tell us so we could prepare for the end of the war in Ukraine and how we can then help in our well, country? For, for sure, you'd have a representation, real representation from all of the elements of the community that were important, the religious, social, youth, obviously women now much have to have a much greater voice. Um, you, you would be much more skilled in bringing people uh, into the decision-making process from uh, other segments of a society. Um, and you'd have a process where it was appropriate, um, maybe not with funds for the airport and the FAA, some person uh, with no knowledge of aeronautics is not gonna be very helpful on that. So you need, but seek out people from all walks of life to give um, the communities people there a sense of representation and participation so that they own what comes out of it. And, and that in itself is, a, is something that uh, we can learn a lot on. We come from civilizations of, you know, whether it was colonialism or whether it was uh, slavery and other, of people coming in and telling populations of how their resources should be spent, what rules they should live under, how they can operate and so on. We, we, we've built very few of them with real participation in that. And we have the chance in rebuilding for that to happen if you have the right government structure. So um, I, I think we can do a much better much better job of it. Um, it what, what, what we have to balance is that democracy or representation without any restraint can also have its own tyranny. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen that. Um, you know, rep, it sounds great, but sometimes you don't get anything done if you just let everybody and everybody's got an opinion and people stand up and talk for hours about, I want this and I want a shopping center here, whatever. And, and, and so there has to be some order and direction and finally people who can make a decision. But how to give people a sense of participation and ownership in the final result is uh, what a science that we're that we're experimenting with and learning. And that's, that's gonna have to be adopted to each culture and so on, but not imposed completely from on high down. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we have to learn. Bruce, you look like you wanted to add something to that. Oh, I just want, there's some other questions I'd like to get to. I'll save my sort of editor for a few minutes now. I'm okay. Svetlana, you have a few questions that have come in, in Ukrainian. Svetlana? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, judge, Danny. Thank you uh, very much for being here. Thank you uh, for sharing your wisdom with us. Susan, Bruce, thank you for your uh, great contribution, for your open hearts and uh, for your support. My question goes as follows. I would want to... Uh, uh, to uh, take over about uh, what uh, Danny has been mentioning uh, regarding forgiveness and uh, reconciliation. 
Ukraine is now uh, uh, taking uh, a very uh, uh, difficult and painful path. I think uh, all people in Ukraine feel pain. Uh, we can hardly find somebody in Ukraine who doesn't uh, feel pain. In the meantime, uh, we are already thinking about what will happen when the war is over. I, I will, I will not uh, tell now about how the war uh, can end. Uh, of course, we have our um, aspirations. We have uh, our vision of uh, of how uh, the war should uh, end. Uh, but we, are, I would not want to focus on it now. I, I just want to to focus on post-war period. And uh, uh, I have a question. So when the war I is uh, over, uh, how, how reconciliation uh, and how how forgiveness uh, may look like? What what would be the uh, the uh, character? Well, uh, like uh, what would, could be the science uh, uh, of, uh, of 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 this forgiveness? Because uh, now many uh, people say that they will would not be able to forgive. Uh, and uh, many uh, uh, people uh, in Ukraine uh, think that uh, there can be uh, no uh, forgiveness uh, without uh, um, without uh, um, repentance, uh, repentance from Russians. Uh, and uh, but I don't know. I don't know whether we can ex expect any from them uh, so uh, i will repeat my question what forgiveness may look like and how can we uh, say that there are signs or there are there is hope uh, to to have forgiveness and reconciliation it, it's a it's a great question and, and one that i don't really feel qualified to answer but i'll give you what i can which is that um, there, there are people who committed war crimes, uh, which are traditionally and internationally recognized. And I, I find it in, in some ways um, that it's a, it's a real question of whether, quote, forgiveness and all that applies to areas of just plain old war crimes. Um, as to the rest and whether the Russian people themselves, if this ends in a way that a lot of their population that has not been really aware of what's going on and so on, whether or not there's hope for reconciliation, reparations to be made from a, 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 a Russia that wants to do it. Um, I don't know um, whether that could happen in a way that at least the beginnings of, of uh, um, reconciliation could happen. Um, it's hard to imagine right now with all the destruction and tyranny that's happened to be forgiving it while it's still going on and with all the destruction that's occurred. But my, my hope is that there are a lot of good and well-meaning people in Russia who, if given the um, opportunity, would want to make and hopefully will, will make reparations and will work toward uh, that kind of forgiveness and, and redemption that is possible in the human spirit. I don't know whether historically or, but, and it's so, hard at this point 
when the destruction is still going on and the drones are still happening and people are still being, uh, still being killed and at risk to be talking forgiveness and redemption. But we need to keep those examples that have happened in history alive. And, and we, we, we have to remember, for instance, as Americans, if you had told me that I would look in Europe to Germany, me, a, 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 a child of the, of the Holocaust, and a family that I would be looking to Germany as maybe one of the most enlightened governments in Europe, and and in 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 many ways, uh, I would say not impossible. I mean, for 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 so many years, I wouldn't buy a German car, or I wouldn't do it, anything to do with it. So it. it I just have hope that the human spirit can uh, rego a new skin and that people can find forgiveness in their hearts and that the that the people who impose these hardships and these crimes will seek redemption and forgiveness. I don't know if we'll get there. I mean, you know, I don't want to be quixotic about it. But I have, I have, I have hope. It's awfully hard to say that to people who've suffered like you have and to look at Galena and say, start thinking about forgiving the, 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 the Russians. Hell, right now you're still fighting for your survival. I think all we can do is keep an aspirational message out there and remind people that regardless of when, there will be a day where forgiveness is something to be contemplated individually. Each person makes that decision for themselves if they can and when. And maybe it's a topic that we need to spend some more time around as we get further along in this uh, series of conversations. That, that, that's well stated and it's a very individual thing. And I think people like myself have to be very careful not to sound preachy or whatever it is about it. It's just such a difficult personal subject and pe to talk to people who've recently lost loved ones and all that about forgiveness and redemption, it's probably premature. Other questions in the minute or so we have left, is there a final? question. Otherwise, Danny, I, I think I'd like to give you a, an opportunity. Uh, first of all, let me just kind of on behalf of everybody uh, uh, say thank you. I, um, you know, I have on my desk a quote, uh, uh, one of life's most uh, pressing and urgent questions, uh, what are you doing for others today? And you are not just uh, your stories, but you're a living example of what you're doing for others each and every day that I hope uh, people, when they sit back from today's conversation, uh, draw from that example. So thank, thank you, you, as always, for your sharing. But, uh, give you a final uh, a thought and, and afterwards, if people have questions that we haven't had a chance to get to, uh, we'll make sure we circle back and try and address them. But Danny, please. Um, well, First of all, and I'm not saying this reflexively, it's, a, it's a, an honor to speak to you all and to be around you. Um, the, the lesson that Ukraine and its people have taught us nationally of your courage and your, and your resistance has been a gift to, 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 to us in the in, in, in the rest of the world. Um, I, I, I hope you know how much inspiration you have given us in your courage. Um, and we, we wanna be a part of the so-called reconciliation or adapt, adapting to 
the dislocation and everything else in any way we can. And we wanna learn from you the idea that there are now a couple hundred Ukrainians and, 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 and an emerging group in Poland as neighbors who wanna learn about mediation, who wanna form groups to solve problems and go about them is very heartening. And I wanna thank the people who've been a part of that, Alina, for your leadership in it. Um, we, you have the firm and complete pledge from Ellen Bass, who's here, who's our wonderful executive director, Bruce, who, and, and others from our board, Rebecca Westerfield and others who've been involved in this. You have our pledge that we will give you the resources and any help we can in your, in your um, continued uh, struggle to, uh, to, to relocate, to, to adjust, and then when you start rebuilding. And um, you got, you've got partners in that. Melina, you're stuck with us. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna be here and uh uh together uh we'll learn as much from you and from your colleagues as you will from us we really don't think we have answer we we're learning a lot a lot from you and we we're we're we're, we're one of the things that teaches us is how small this world's become and i some days i hate zoom and i hate all the technology and everything else and now with AI and so on. But the fact that it's brought us this close and that we can be together at any time we want and at least talk and see and I can feel you here, um, that's a great gift. And, and we plan to continue it and work with you toward whatever that reconciliation is. Thank you, so Dan. Thank you. Thank you for what you've taught us. Thank you, everyone. Um, Aglina, I think this brings to a conclusion uh, this afternoon's conversation. I just wish uh, on behalf of Susan and myself and Danny and Ellen and everyone else uh, from the uh, fellowship and foundation, we wish you all first and foremost safety uh, and good health uh, as we continue our dialogue and our effort to work together. So it's really a joy and a privilege uh, to spend time with you today. We look forward to our next opportunity.